everybody. Uh, thank you very much for um, coming to the. I've got issues already here. There we go for the the last presentation today. There we go. Hopefully that'll work now. There we go. Um, yes, thanks very much for coming, guys. Um, we've had some great presentations the last couple of days, um, especially those pertaining to firefighters. A lot of the great topics we've talked about have focused a lot on structural firefighters. So. I thought it would be just a really, uh, a really good thing to, to make sure everybody's familiar with another big, big firefighting community in this, in this country as well as abroad. I know we've got some folks in from Australia, uh, Canada, um, back over in Europe too. Um, wildland firefighting is, is, is big, big business. And the season's actually started already in this country. So some of you guys have been following the news. California um, has already had a few kick off. We haven't had too many in the Midwest yet, but um, Wildland firefighters do have a lot of the same concerns that structural do, but with some slight differences too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these today. Now, just with a, a, a show of hands here, how many of you um, have know much about fi uh, wildland firefighters, have worked as or worked with wildland? Okay. Oh, we've got a couple. Good. Lovely. Okay. So for those of you that are not so sure, I thought I'd just start out here by um, showing just a couple of a couple of uh, pictures. I'm a big believer in that a picture say a thousand words. So um, hopefully it's a drag across here. So I started working with wildland folks about five or six years ago. And to be, co to be completely honest with you, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, I was doing more structural kind of work. I'll just ignore the bits down the bottom there. Um, doing more work with structural firefighters. And a friend of a friend said, do you know anyone who is an excise physiologist that can help give us a little bit of advice on what to do with our wildland folks? And so I kind of got in that way. So I had to learn very quickly what wildland firefighting was all about. And it is, it is got a lot of distinct differences to, to structural. As you can kind of see from this um, little snapshot here, um, the type of uniform looks very different. The type of job tasks are different. We've got a lot of hiking that's going on. Obviously, you saw them on a road there, but it's more like trails half the time. Um, we've got some folks kind of coming down from, uh, from planes, parachuting down into fires. You can see the proximity that they are working relative to these, uh, these fires here, the type of things they've got. They don't have the big um, gas tanks that our structural folks do. So very, very different kind of climate. And there's lots of different disciplines within wildland firefighting too. We've got our hot shots that we see kind of here. We've got our smoke jumpers. Those are the guys that kind of jump down uh, obviously parachute down, typically the last line of defense for some buildings and some individuals who couldn't get out of the path of the fire. We've got our helitech crews, we've got our engine crews, we've got our other hand crews, we've got a lot of different disciplines. So there's a lot of, excuse me, a lot of, uh, oops, Daisy, now I've got to drag it right across again. Okay, there we go. So we've got a lot of different, um, disciplines within this, this whole field of wildland um, firefighting. But the key thing across all of the disciplines is the need for physical fitness, as we see obviously with structural and volunteer firefighters too. Um, as it pertains to wildland, I think what this quote by Brian Sharkey sums up really, really nicely the importance of fitness for this population though. And um, th this quote comes from the first edition of the fitness and work capacity document that Brian Sharkey and the folks over in uh, University of Montana actually put together in the uh, late 1990s. He states here, fitness is the most important determinant of work capacity. So um, I actually loved uh, Dr. Frost, um, I don't know if he's uh, hanging around here, but his uh, term capacity saying in the last talk there, because capacity implies more than just physical. Okay, applies your ability to actually cope with the stresses of doing the job. Okay, we, we can go in absolutely and say fitness is going to help with job performance. We all know that it is a part of job performance for firefighters, but they can already do the skills that they know how to do. They know how to fight fires already, but physical fitness can actually help them cope with the stresses that the job places upon their body, upon their mind, emotions, and everything. And that's one of the biggest selling points here with wildland folks too. So I quite like this quote because it really sums up the importance of fitness. Now, wildland guys are um, honestly, I think, a little bit ahead of some structural situations sometimes. Because guys, take a little look at this graph here. This is taken, or this, excuse me, table. This is taken out of fitness and work capacity, um, edition three, okay, which is 2009. We have got our 
excuse me, our um, five fighters up the top there, our hot shots, our repellers, our smoke jumpers, and I'll talk a little bit about their different uh, job descriptions in just a moment. But folks, these physical fitness tests are required for them. Okay, required. I'm not talking just out of the academy like the CPAT. This is required physical fitness testing. Ah, uh, that's right. I won't answer it for you. You're fine. That's what we do with my students. It's all good. Um, these are required tests. Okay, now we've got the uh, PAC test. How many of you guys have heard of the PAC test before? Okay, good. Some of you have. Those of you who have not, the PAC test that we've got right on the, uh, the far side there, this is a three mile, excuse me, a three mile hike. That must be done with a 45 pound weighted vest within 45 minutes, pass fail, okay? So doesn't sound too bad, right? But you've got to do that pack test and if you do the field or walk test, and I'll, I'll talk about those towards the end of the presentation, you've got to do those in the environment in which you're actually working. So if we think a lot about wildland stuff here, we're typically at slightly higher altitudes. We might not be high, high, but we're gonna be three, four, five, six, maybe, maybe a little more than that, thousand feet above sea level, okay? So that adds another kind of element to it. Uh, the three mile pack out weight, okay, that is another three mile hike, but is actually done with a backpack as opposed to a weighted vest. And that backpack is uh, of the weight that you see kind of in that column there, of the weight that reflects the type of load that that specific discipline may have to pack out, may have to hike out of an emergency situation. So you guys, if you look at the smoke jumpers there, that three mile pack out weight is required 110. That means they've got to hike out three miles in 90 minutes with a 110 pound backpack. Okay, that, that's that, that particular test. So two tests that were actually very much developed by the folks over at Missoula Technologies and Development, MTDC, Brian Sharkey, Dr. Brian Sharkey, and the folks at University of Montana, Steve Gaskell and those guys, they're, they're big in putting that together. That is a population specific test. It suggests that there is a minimum aerobic fitness of somewhere in the late, uh, well, high 30s, early 40s milliliters kilogram per minute that's necessary for wildland firefighters for these particular guys. But we look across the table here and you've got 1.5 mile run time. Now we all know that's to do with aerobic capacity, aerobic fitness. We've got the 10 RM uh, leg press and bench press. So we think 10 RM, although it's 10 RM, it's still related to muscular strength. We look at our pull-ups, our push-ups, and our, our sit-ups. And I'll talk a little about sit-ups in just a second. But pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, we think muscular endurance. So back in the 1990s, that was a big decade for wildland um, fitness uh, requirements for establishing these. Everything in the black there is required. Required, not just recommended. And it's required every single year. Okay, so we're not talking just out of the academy. Guys, this is, I don't know about you guys, but this to me is one of the biggest differences between the structural and the wildland right now. They've got fitness standards. And the reason I bring that up is uh, we're gonna be kind of having a look and seeing how this fits into um, a needs analysis. Okay, how does now, we talked about needs analysis uh, several times the last couple of days. I know Mark talked about it a little bit yesterday. But within wildland guys, they are different to structural. So we need to go through this needs analysis and figure out how we can actually meet some of the training goals related to that whole work capacity uh, quote that I had earlier. So the great, you know, the great thing is about going late on the second day, at least you've had a whole bunch of awesome presentations that you can refer back to. So needs analysis, hopefully we're feeling pretty comfortable with this right now. We know a needs analysis is a great way to increase the uh, likelihood of optimizing your training program, your intervention, or whatever you're doing. So needs analysis purpose hopefully is pretty obvious. So hopefully are some of the steps associated with a needs analysis. And there's, there's several different ways you can kind of describe this here. I like to use the, uh, the four points that we've got down here. Um, needs analysis, you've got to do a little bit of goal setting, rationale, asking questions to help guide that rationale, program development evaluating current status of individuals. After all, how do you know where you've got to go if you don't know where you currently are? Okay, so we've got to get that current status. Gap analysis, looking at the strengths and weaknesses and how they relate to those goals we identified earlier, and then plan of action. Now, this whole process, if I did this all for wildland firefighters, I, I could spend the rest of the conference talking about this alone. I'm gonna kind of target a little bit the, um, the, the first two of those. Okay, so when it comes to kind of goal setting for wildland firefighters here, the goal setting, we're gonna need to identify who we are actually targeting. Are we gonna look at our hotshots? Are we looking at our smoke jumpers? 
Are we looking at our engine crews, our helitech crews? Okay, are we looking at folks in the fire season or are we looking at folks pre-season or post-season? Because as we're going to see in just a moment, job responsibilities do change throughout the course of the year. As I mentioned a moment ago, the fire season, particularly in California, has really kicked off already. Okay, it's kind of starting and they're, they're, they're thinking right now that Missouri, Iowa, kind of a lot of the Midwest is also going to kick off much earlier than, than, than we think. Okay, so we're actually kind of in season for those guys right now. But perhaps for the folks in Montana, we're not, we're still pre-season. Okay, so what is it that we're actually um, targeting and when? We may have different goals depending upon all of those uh, answers to those questions. We might be trying to train folks for the pack test. Okay, that's going to be probably pre-season training that we're getting ready there. We might be looking at um, improving recovery times from call-outs. Because unlike to some degree with structural guys, our wildland folks don't get a nice kind of 72-hour period, guaranteed period, where they're not at work. We might have with our wildland guys, when the season starts, they get a call out for two or three days. They may get to return to their base for one day, but then they may get a call out the next day and they're gone for another few days. So we may not have a chance to actually do fitness training with them, at least not in the way that we've, we've talked about a lot of the, the rest of the conference so far. So what do we have to do pre-season? And when we do get a chance to have them for a couple of days, what's going to be best practice? Um, then maintaining fitness capacity throughout the fire season. Now, maintain is the key thing there because we've got to have good fitness levels in order to maintain, right? So what is the actual goal setting? What are we interested in doing with these folks? Now, to help us kind of uh, um, answer some of those questions, we're going to ask more questions. <laughs> we're going to see, well, wh why is it that we need to even address this? What, what are we seeing with wildland folks that is... Uh, suggest there is a need to implement a fitness training program, uh, an injury re uh, risk reduction program. I don't like to use the word injury prevention because unfortunately we can prevent all of our injuries, but we can reduce the risk. Why do we need to get training programs in with uh, wildland firefighters? So I won't kind of go through all of these questions because uh, they're really just a nice big checklist for you guys to ask in figuring out what are the priorities for training wildland folks. Um, there's lots of different resources out there for us. We, we've got lots of resources when it comes to structural folks, but also with wildland. But not all the ones for structural can be used for wildland. Um, and I'll kind of uh, um, differentiate that in just a little bit. I like to kind of point that out because um, let's take, for example, our N, uh, um, NFPA 1583 and 1582 up there. Those are primarily for structural folks. They're not for wildland. Okay, They don't help wildland very much at all. Okay. So we might have to kind of pick and choose other resources that we actually uh, use to help educate ourselves on wildland needs. Now, this is where those fitness assessments come in. So I think I'm kind of looking or reviewing this needs analysis so I can plug in what we already know about wildland firefighters to help guide further um, fitness improvements. So those fitness assessments that I brought up a few slides ago, this is where they plug in to a needs analysis. They're going to be used to evaluate the current status of our wildland crews. Um, the assessments themselves, we've got some for aerobic fitness. We've got muscular strength. We've got muscular endurance in there. We do have the pack test and the pack out, the weight pack out test also, that are thought to be a little bit more related to uh, functional aerobic capacity as it relates to wildland fire. So assessment of current status, but we might need to do more than that, depending upon the goals that we have for the training program for these wildland firefighters. If it's more about injury risk reduction, okay, then those, those particular assessments might, might not be enough. We might have to actually add in some more assessments to get us the information that we want. Um, I just got a, a couple of emails through from some friends of mine actually in California that work with one of the fire academies here. And they are having some, some horrendous problems right now with some of the issues we've discussed for structural, and that is uh, injuries on, um, uh, due to physical training. Okay, a lot of twisted ankles we're seeing, lots of kind of uh, um, sprains and strains and things like that. Well, well, that's another kind of part of perhaps the needs analysis rationale that we build in for these guys too. The gap analysis here, this is where 
excuse me, we'd start to evaluate those um, assessments and look to see where there are strengths and weaknesses uh, within the firefighting groups that we are working with. Um, do they have sufficient muscular strength? Do they have sufficient muscular endurance, aerobic capacity? Obviously, you guys have seen this before. Um, very similar to structural folks, though, is w we can't expect to see all the same weaknesses and strengths in the wildland firefighter crews that we work with. Um, they're not all going to have the same things going on. Some might have bad backs, some might have weak ankles. So you're kind of seeing, hopefully, some crossover here from what we've talked about regarding structural guys. And then putting in a plan of action. So identifying possible ways for us to, uh, to target the goals that we have um, identified as needed within this population, and also based around some of the uh, assessment results that we've already seen. What plan of action should we be putting into place that will help these wildland firefighters achieve their training goals or their maintenance goals or their risk reduction goals? So just as with many other groups, uh, that we've discussed, we're going to ask ourselves some questions that will help guide this, this plan of action. Now, obviously, this part of the needs analysis, I'm not going to go into uh, to a great extent today because it is going to be based on individual disciplines within the firefighting community. But these are some of the general considerations that relate to these four points of a needs analysis for wildland firefighters. Oftentimes within wildland groups, particularly our hotshots and our um, uh, other hand crews, we're going to see um, organizational support for fitness training. Okay, we see the Boise land management folks. We see the National uh, Wildfire Coordinating Group who are actually responsible for putting together the fitness and work capacity document. Um, we see these guys supporting physical fitness. For those of you who have not heard of MTDC before, this is the Missoula Technologies and Development Center in Missoula, Montana. Here they have a uh, exercise physiologist, a guy called Dr. Joe Dimitrovich. He is also a hotshot firefighter. He's actually taken the, this summer off. First summer is taking off for about uh, 10 years because he's just had a, a, a new baby boy. Okay, but so he gets excused, he's allowed to. Okay, but they have organizational support. His job is to do research that will help empower and educate professional practice related to physical fitness and health in wildland firefighters. So he is actually undertaking right now um, a review of the uh, uh, job demands of engine crews, helitech, hotshots, and smoke jumpers. And I've got some of his preliminary results I'll share with you in just a moment. So there's organizational support excuse me, for improving physical fitness. Um, within wildland firefighting, as you hear me said already, it's a seasonal, seasonal gig for some, okay? But we do have a lot of uh, wildland firefighters that are there all year round, okay? So we've got a nice kind of mix of those that are there all year round to serve as mentors or to help kind of coach those who are coming in as seasonal workers um, regarding whatever crews they're working on. I mean, in some firefighter crews, we may actually have college students, kind of that's their summer job, okay? So um, having those year-round folks who have the experience to serve as mentors, they are frequently the ones in charge of training, okay? That's what I found in my experience, especially with um, some of the hand crews I've worked with, okay? Um, exercise facilities on base. Now, unfortunately, I'd like to say there's like a nice big Gold's Gym or LA Fitness kind of facility on each of the bases. That's not the case, but they do have oftentimes exercise equipment there, or they have made use of other modalities. Maybe they're using firefighter equipment. Maybe they're using sandbags. Maybe they're using other tools that are actually available on base. So that's a great facilitating factor that's going to assist with program implementation. And obviously, you guys can kind of read a lot of what we've got down here. Um, potential compounding factors, occupational um, stress. Obviously, this is pretty consistent across um, all firefighting um, groups here. Um, lack of knowledge or willingness. Now, you might kind of be a little confused here because I do have kind of good foundation of exercise knowledge on one side and then lack of knowledge on the other. Um, facilitating factors is, is we have these firefighters who are year long, who are career firefighters. They have been doing the pack test year and year, after year after year. They know how to train for it. They know how to maintain their fitness or at least work on maintaining their fitness throughout the entire year, throughout the season. They have a good knowledge of what is appropriate and what is considered um, uh, optimal training, not overtraining practice. But then we do have some folks coming in who don't have that knowledge. Okay, for example, those maybe those who are seasonal workers or the younger guys kind of coming in. 
we don't always have that knowledge. And we actually think that might be some of the reason why we're seeing some of these um, injuries during physical training too. Lack of knowledge on how to actually work out if the appropriate guidance is not present. Okay? Um, in some of the, uh, the t two of the hotshot groups that I've gone in and kind of worked with on fitness assessments, we've uh, stuck around and kind of looked at their workout um, approaches and so forth, and they've asked us for kind of feedback on what they're doing, what we think of it, exercise order. And one of the only things when a program is, is run by somebody who is a career firefighter, they know how to work out. One of the few things that we've ever had to correct them on is how they stretch. Um, things like, for example, doing a hurdler stretch, you know, getting the knee kind of all up here and putting it in a slightly confounding position. That's about the only things in those that have been working for a long period of time in wildland fire that they know their stuff. Okay. Um, exercise is non-existent in field. Okay. So the reason I say exercise is non-existent in the field there or exercise um, uh, capabilities, unlike sometimes structural firefighters, wildland folks may have to stay out on the fire line. They may have to sleep rough for several days in a row. Okay, they, they don't, they're not going to be taking a lunch hour to go and do their workout. They don't have the rules like one hour. Every day you're on duty, you get one hour to work out. No, that, that's, that's a, a moot point. Okay, you don't have that type of thing. Okay, they're doing physical exertive efforts out on the fire line already. They're not going to take a lunch hour to then go and make sure they get their squats in, their lunges in, and all that fun stuff. Okay, so that's, that's non existent. There's also a high, high, high priority for rest when they come back to base, as I've kind of indicated a little bit there already. Okay. So when we think about kind of these, these crews, those facilitating and confounding factors may differ depending upon what type of uh, discipline within wildland firefighting we're actually going to be working with. Um, I had actually on one of the previous slides there motivational factors. What's going to motivate folks to, to work out? This is going to differ a little bit, potentially, depending upon which crew you're working with. Let's take um, your smoke jumpers, for example. Your smoke jumpers typically work in very small groups, twos, threes. Okay, whereas your hot shots, we're looking here at groups of 18, 19, 20. So there may, there may be a better inclination towards perhaps a body workout, one, two people working together, one spots, one works out, then you switch over in the hot shot groups more of a group approach if we're looking at um, the hot shots, okay? So these different crews um, may have differing kind of confounding and uh, facilitating factors when um, looking at physical fitness training, okay? One thing, though, that we do encourage across all of these groups, though, is this little mantra, okay? Get fit to fight fire. Don't use firefighting to get fit, okay? We know firefighting is a physically exertive job. Okay, so generally, if you're doing physical exertive efforts, then you tend to go through a slightly training, uh, a training adaptation there. But this is not something that um, we want to see in, in our firefighters. And we do have the benefit of being able to use the pack test a little bit to try and avoid this. So if we know folks have got to train for the pack test every single season, pre-season, okay, if we know they've got to train for that, then there is an increased likelihood me, that they're going to start the fire season with a little bit higher um, fitness level. Okay, so that, that's a good thing. Um, it also means that they're probably going to come with somewhat of a foundation of aerobic fitness already. Um, and don't get me wrong, we do have people that fail the, uh, the pack test. Okay, and uh, we do have had some serious incidents of, oh, that was me, sorry, <laughs> of, of heart attacks. Okay, I wonder what it was. It was good. <laughs> Um, oh, so silly. It's like I've never done this before. Um, we do have some issues of heart attacks um, when individuals do the pack test, okay? They're not physically ready to actually do that test, okay? That is a scary, scary thing because if they can't do that pack test, then th they're going to be in for a very, very troubling uh, fire season, which is why that's a minimal standard. Um, so we know that coming in for that pack test, they probably got a good foundation of aerobic fitness if they have trained appropriately for it. Um, but within firefighting, as you guys are going to see in just a moment, wildland fire tasks require more than just aerobic fitness. We're going to have some tasks that will test the phosphagen system, some that will test the glycolytic system. So we may have to kind of then build on that training capacity. Um, Gaskell, uh, Steve Gaskell over at Montana, there's a lot of research from Montana guys when it comes to uh, wildland folks, okay? A lot of research out there. I'll discuss the politics of that after we, uh, after we get done. But Steve Gaskell, 2002, 2003, came out with some awesome studies 
One of those was actually looking at um, metabolic cost, uh, jobs on the fire line, and came out with this uh, recommendation that it's between 1.5, 2.5 liters per minute VO2 is, is the average uh, oxygen consumption during a lot of fire line tasks. Okay, so you're going to see some variation there. But what this doesn't, the research has suggested, always take into consideration is the metabolic, increased metabolic demand um, presented by PPEs. Okay, so PPEs such as clothing. Okay, um, study by Joe Dimitrovic in 2011. Nice little kind of reminder here on the obvious. Okay, if you have a little look at this, um, this particular diagram here, um, we've got single layers, kind of a, just pick one of the lines on the bottom there, and then a double layer of clothing. Now, although we don't see a significant increase in body temperature when um, these guys are wearing these uh, increased layers of clothing during a couple of hours of, uh, of activity, it's not a big raise in body temperature, but we know that even small raises in body temperature uh, increase metabolic costs. So um, I hope for you guys too, this is a bit of a, a no-brainer kind of study, but it was done in wildland firefighters, which is important because the PPEs that they wear look different to structural. Okay, they, there's some similarities, but there's also some slight differences. They don't tend to be um, quite as bulky. Could you guys imagine, those of you who are structural firefighters, doing that uh, pack test with all of the PPEs for structural firefighting on? No, kind of a lot more, right? Absolutely. So we've got on the, uh, the far side there, we've got a, um, a smoke jumper. And on the uh, side closest to me here, the right side, we've got a hot shot. Okay, so look, they've got slightly different uh, PPE kind of setups there. Smoke jumper tends to have slightly thicker PPEs. The hot shot guy, just a little bit, little bit thinner oftentimes. Um, the helmets are a little bit different. But what I will kind of take time to just point out with these diagrams too is how they're carrying load. Okay, have a look at the smoke jumper there. That's a reserve parachute there, as well as their personal gear bag. So they may still have to actually carry um, instruments too. Yeah. Oh, I talk about running mechanics and stuff in a second too. But hot shot guys. These guys have got their packs on. Um, you may be able to see it just at the back there. We've got a backpack on. We've got some kind of a, almost like a utility belt around here. Um, so slightly different kind of setup of gear and also um, loading, uh, load mechanics and load requirements there. Okay. So it looks a little bit different. Okay. So hopefully you've, you've kind of got the drift here that we've got these seasons with wildland firefighting. So if we think about metabolic demand, metabolic needs, we could probably introduce very, very uh, in a very straightforward manner a periodization approach to help folks train. And I'm not going to spend too long on this because we have discussed this in other uh, presentations previously. But these particular seasons do allow us to, to uh, potentially focus on very concentrated areas of fitness. And I've got it really here more from the bioenergetic side of things. I haven't really gone big time into muscular strength, endurance, what we're working on. But you guys can see in the pre-season, we're going to be preparing for the pack test. So we're going to be able to work on aerobic capacity. That's going to be a big, big time emphasis. Now, how we go about doing that, whether it's long, slow distance runs, whether it's a little bit of interval training, that's, that's going to be dependent on many other factors there. But we want to establish a good aerobic foundation. We're going to work on stabilization. We're going to work on movement patterns, a lot of what Dr. Frost kind of talked about just before um, I came here. Muscular endurance and strength. That's going to be some of our pre-season emphases. In-season, injury prevention, probably should put injury risk reduction, but and maintenance of fitness. The key thing is, in season, they're not going to have as much time to work on improving fitness. Just like um, if you take a competitive sports team. If you guys have a look at the research right now with competitive sports teams, their overall fitness actually decreases in the competitive season. Their sports-specific skill may increase, but their fitness decreases. So it's all about what you're doing in the off-season leading into the pre-season to help kind of get your level up here for the beginning of the competitive season so you've got more capacity for, for drop and we'll hopefully minimize how much drop we see. Okay? Same thing goes with these guys, folks. Now, those weeks, uh, kind of take those with a little bit of a pinch of salt. That's going to vary depending upon where we are in the country. What the research has very strongly suggested, once again, uh, due to research such as that done by Steve Gaskell and Brian Sharkey, is that fitter individuals do have a greater work capacity. Now, the study that he did here, for which this diagram actually demonstrates, is that those with a higher lactate threshold, okay, so theoretically those with greater aerobic fitness, 
we'll actually be able to put forth a greater work capacity, put out more effort uh, during a call out. And we've got an example of a nine day uh, duty cycle here. We actually have two call outs during this period of time and you guys can probably see those with the spikes there. So day two to four and then from six to eight. Those were the two call outs that we saw in that nine day period. The person, uh, excuse me, the group of firefighters with the higher lactate threshold, the greater aerobic fitness, they were able to actually put forth more caloric expenditure and that was assumed to be greater work capacity. Okay, so just on this side, before we do move on, I will have you guys note on the y-axis there, that is our caloric expenditure. Look at the caloric expenditure these guys are actually putting out per day. We're up in the fourth, ne nearly, nearly 5,000 calories. That's a buttload of effort they're putting out there. Okay, a lot of the research coming out of MTDC, uh, there's a few health and safety reports that kind of discuss this more, has suggested that for every day they're out near the fire line, um, these particular firefighters, and this was a group of hotshot guys, are expending between four and 6,000 calories. Okay, four and 6,000 calories. So remember that as we get further on here. So if we look at these bioenergetic demands, I've put together an extremely simplistic, very simplistic fitness continuum here. Um, for hotshot guys, so IHC is interagency hotshot crews, hotshot crews in season, okay? Now, this obviously is definitely subject to debate depending upon the demands that the hotshot crew that you are working with actually puts forth, but based on kind of in season, they're gonna be really relying on a lot of endurance, okay? They're gonna be digging fire lines, they're gonna be doing a lot of hikes, that's a lot of muscular endurance, a lot of aerobic endurance there. <coughs> so this particular continuum, we're probably going to see excuse me, the, uh, the little circle, more towards endurance and strength a little bit there. Um, if I put up here perhaps uh, smoke jumpers instead, they're the guys gonna be parachuting down kind of uh, um, into somewhat dangerous areas. They're gonna be doing a little bit more possibly emergency um, rescues or responses. We might move the middle of their circle more between strength and power, okay? So it does kind of bring up this, this idea that depending upon the group, wildland firefighter group you're working with, what part of the season you're actually in, their training goals, training demands might be a little bit, might be a little bit different. So we kind of have to train for a whole bunch of different things. So moving on from bioenergetic just a little bit, we will, we can't really kind of talk about wildland guys without looking at some of these, these job demands in much uh, closer detail. So looking at the biomechanics of the movement patterns during common tasks. Now, with structural folks, we know, as uh, John Bennett pointed out earlier today, that there's been a lot of different task analyses conducted. Within wildland firefighting, not as much, okay, not as much. We saw a bunch conducted in the 1990s by Sharkey and Gaskill, and we are just, as I mentioned earlier, going through a re-review of job analyses. But for wildland folks, the big, probably best resource I can recommend to you to look at is the fitness and work capacity. Okay, have any of you guys heard of the fitness and work capacity document? If you haven't, I've actually got a copy up here with me, so if you wanna take a look at the end of the presentation, please come up and have a look. This fitness and work capacity is on its third edition right now, 2009, okay, is that third edition release. You saw the quote from the first edition in uh, 1997. Um, this contains a lot of information on Wildland Firefighter. I've actually stolen a lot of the uh, tables from there for this presentation today. NFPA 1582 is not, Wildland, and that's actually a little, um, a I had a typo in your guys' uh, PowerPoint that I put out for you guys. I forgot to hit the enter after NFPA 1582, so my apologies. So it actually says fitness and work capacity in your guys' text is not for firefighters, that's the other way around, okay? So fitness and work capacity is great for wildland folks. Uh, NFPA standard 1051 and 1977, these are, these are okay, they are targeted towards wildland firefighters, but if you guys read them, they're very, very vague. One of them, I think, is about four pages. That's it. And those of you who've seen 1582 and 1583, it's like a doorstop, okay? It's, it's a big old thing, okay? So these movement patterns are gonna be slightly different depending upon the tasks for different disciplines within wildland firefighting. So we've got to get to know what it is for the teams that we're possibly working with. We've gotta understand, for example, the load carriage and gate mechanics that might be, uh, might be different between these firefighters and those that we're more commonly used to working with, such as our structural folks. Um, take, for example, here, a couple of the statements right at the bottom. Um, within a hotshot crew, as I said, there's usually about 18 or 20 folks in a hotshot crew. 
any of their weight, the, uh, the, the equipment they're going to be carrying is going to be distributed amongst every single person in that crew. So the current recommendation is they have no more than approximately 25 uh, kilograms of gear per person. Okay? Um, that might be in addition to some stuff they're carrying in their pack. For smoke jumpers, however, they're going to be carrying between 45 and 100 pounds um, of extra load. They may have that extra parachute on there as well as their, their gear. So these are some considerations when we think about training. You guys saw on a few slides ago where they may have to actually carry that load too. Is it on the front? Is it on the back? Is it down by the side? That's going to influence possibly some of the exercise choices we have for these guys. Okay. Um, as I pointed out earlier, a little bit of difference between structural guys. We don't tend to see as much um, self-contained breathing apparatus with the wild land guys. Okay. So this is one of those uh, sets of tables I stole from the fitness and work capacity document. You guys will see that um, across wild land crews, they could be carrying any uh, a, a quite a quite a large range of possible weights and doing quite a large range of possible intensities of effort. We've got everything from very light things that they might be lifting or moving to very heavy, so everything from 10 to 100 pounds, and then the type of intensities of work they could be doing, anything really from light and moderate up to very, uh, very, very intense. So it kind of uh, gets us starting to really, really appreciate that wide range of metabolic demands and possible um, biomechanical demands that might be needed. So the training implications here, we've got to understand the job requirements. I know you've seen this a lot and heard this so much for the structural guys, but we can't assume it's the same for the wildland folks. Um, they don't tend to lift quite as much heavy, heavy weight unless you're that smoke jumper. Um, so it gets us kind of thinking here, well, what is appropriate then for the training program? What exercises do we want them actually doing? How much weight do we actually want them lifting? What's going to be the emphasis for these guys? Okay. So what I wanted to do to give us kind of an example of or get us thinking more specifically about some of these questions, I'm going to um, have a closer look at smoke jumpers and um, hotshot folks. And as I mentioned to you a moment ago, in the kind of late, well, mid to late 2013, MTDC started the process of re-reviewing um, job analyses. And um, uh, Joe and his crew over at MTDC interviewed a bunch of smoke jumpers and um, a bunch of hotshots. And the smoke jumpers all revealed these things as their, their, their big tasks that they undertake excuse me, as part of their seasonal, uh, pre-season and seasonal job requirements. So building a fire line with hand tools. Now, ironically, I, I always think it's quite ironic when we say building a fire line with hand tools because actually kind of digging away a fire line. Um, working in adverse conditions. Guys, have a look at what this parachute, what this smoke jumper is parachuting into. Okay, that's some, so that's some adverse conditions there. Um, if we kind of combine that with right at the very last bullet point there, tree landing. Okay, if they can't see where they're going, there's a likelihood they may have to land in a tree. Okay, well, you land in a tree, okay, you've got to get out of that tree. Okay, so um, these are some things that they may have to do. Okay, so that's not just bad driving, that's literally they can't see. Okay, um, packing heavy loads, we talked about that a little bit already. Um, lifting and carrying, and then chainsawing. Now, it sounds like a bit of a random one to throw in there, right? But chainsawing is a big time occupational task for smoke jumpers and especially for our hot shots, particularly pre-season, and then those that are year-long may actually do this post-season too. Okay, hot shots. You guys see a lot of the similar things here. Okay, we see uh, working in adverse conditions. Okay, now adverse conditions for our hot shot, they're not going to be parachuting down, but they may be sleeping rough for several nights. And I'll show you guys some kind of pictures of that in just a moment. They may also, excuse me, be having to work in very hot, very humid. Um, possibly even very windy conditions. Those of you who've kind of followed the, the, some of the, the tragedies with our hotshot folks last, um, last year, we know that they had that large amount of deaths because the, the, the severe winds suddenly changed direction and shifted the fire into a path that was unpredicted. Okay? Um, lofting, moving and carrying loads, okay? heavy loads as well as light loads there, and then uh, chainsaw use once again. So here's a little bit of a better description. Once again, nice table I stole from a fitness and, and work capacity here. But this table gives us a little bit more um, idea of what some of those job tasks actually involve. So if we're using hand tools, okay, if we're digging fire lines, what kind of tools are we using? Well, we might be using um, a, a tool called a Pulaski. Okay, it's going to help us actually dig out that fire line. 
Okay, and it's going to be important for us to look at that job too in just a moment. Because if we're working with our hot shots, there's a reason there's a team of 20. Okay, the first one will go on, start that fire line. The next one will come along, help dig out that spot even more. And you've got a whole chain of folks coming. So by the time we get to the end of the chain, we've got a nice fire line dug. Okay. Um, chainsawing, lifting, carrying loads. Look at the loads they might be carrying here. We might be just simply moving twigs or brush um, out of the way. We might be repositioning equipment and so on and so forth. So a little bit deeper definition of what we might be doing there. So let's have a look and see. So some job specific tasks for both five, uh, for hot shots and for smoke jumpers include this idea of, of pack outs, uh, hiking, okay, um, with heavy and with light loads. So we've got our uh, some hot shot guys right there. You guys see the kind of loads they're doing. It's going to be about 25 kilograms um, that we've got them lifting. Excuse me, so somewhere around maybe 50 pounds, something like that. Um, the ability to do this general hiking, and guys, I'm not talking about just kind of from here down to the Wendy's or whatever, down the road. Okay, we're talking miles. Okay, we're talking typically two, three, four, five, six miles is that hiking. Okay. So Gaskell kind of coined the fitness needed to do this particular job demand as sustainable fitness. Okay, so when I think sustainable, I think fitness that has been achieved and now must be maintained. Okay, so when are we going to achieve this type of fitness? Pre-season, right? Okay, yeah, before the season in preparation using the pack test as a way to develop this type of fitness. Okay, now we could do, as I said before, several different types of training to improve that aerobic capacity. That's going to depend upon the fitness status of the individuals you're working with. Do you need to work on improving aerobic fitness in those who are not prepared for the pack test? Well, that's when we might do some of those more long, slow distance type things, okay, jogs and so on. For those that need to improve that further or want to improve that further, that's when we can start introducing different training approaches. Um, chainsawing. We said this came up with hot shots and with smoke jumpers. So, folks, take a little look at these two diagrams right here. We've got on the left-hand side, guys kind of standing up a little bit more upright. On the right-hand side here, bending over, chainsawing. You see the different types, obviously, of, of uh, size of trees they might be sawing down. Now, if we have a look, particularly at the one, obviously, on the far side, a little bit clearer there. What type of stress is that person experiencing on their body right now? What's, uh, what, 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 what's going on with their body? What do they have to have going on that's enabling them to do that chainsawing successfully and without pain? Isometric yeah, isometric endurance of, of what? Everything, right? Yeah. Where else? What, what's, taking, what's taking the big load here? What part of the body? Where's he going to be feeling it tomorrow morning? Hands, yep. Grip, okay. Where else? Yeah, upper extremity, shoulders, absolutely. Upper back and lower back, yeah, we'd all kind of agree with that, right? Absolutely. So watching this here, he's going to have to train several different elements in order to be able to do that uh, chainsawing, right? He's going to have to have some strong, sta stable shoulders. He's going to have to have some good grip strength. Well, well, how can we improve grip strength? What training approaches have you guys heard of for improving grip strength? Any particular approaches? How many you guys ever? Bars. Say again, sorry. Wider bars. wider bars, yeah. Gripping things, right? Using wider bars to promote greater activation. Yeah, good. What else? What else have you guys heard of? Yeah, good. You guys ever done those battling ropes? Kind of, a, we've talked about shoulders already. Might be a good idea for, for those shoulders, right? Could be an approach. Battling ropes, though, do we need a, a kind of a foundation of muscular strength before we do those battling ropes? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I know you hear about battling ropes all the time in... Um, uh, kind of, um, what's the word I want here, kind of like crash course kind of fitness stuff, you know, going on there, but we do need some prerequisite strength for those battling ropes. You guys ever done rice buckets? Yeah, kind of like tight riper, t -t -tight, um, tight writer, can't say the words today, then digging our fingers down, then kind of crunching, okay, yeah, absolutely, those types of things. Um, stuff for the upper body, how about the back? Okay, what have we got for back strength? Deadlifts, yeah, extension, good. Now, what I want you guys to think about when you see that guy chainsawing there, though, isometric is the key. So we can strengthen our back with those deadlifts and things like that, but we've also got to be able to resist rotation. If you guys ever try doing that chainsawing there, if you can't resist rotation, that chainsaw is going to push you to one side. 
So everything, things like uh, resisted rotation exercises. So I could have somebody kind of standing up here, put my hands out. They've got to be able to resist me pushing them in different directions. Um, we could do things like paloff presses. Okay, I'm sure some of you have either heard of these or seen these. I might have like a band that's actually tied around a pole here. It comes out, I stretch it out. I get in my nice kind of squat position here. I'm paloff pressing. I'm stopping that band from pulling me over. I switch over, do it the other side. Great exercises for training this particular uh, skill. Okay, using hand tools. Okay, if we do the same looking at this, uh, I think, yeah, looking at this gentleman right here. Um, look at the stance he's in. We've got him kind of one foot forward, okay? Kind of a, almost like a semi-squat, but almost more like an open lunge position, okay? He's not kind of a, he's not a split squat like this. He's more open stance, okay? So, universal athletic position, right? You guys seen this position before? Okay, so squat is a great one to do, but then we're gonna try and progress it into a, a position, perhaps that's a little bit more appropriate for this particular task. But as you've heard over and over again, we've got to do things progressive. So they've got to be able to do a squat before we then go into one that's a little bit more challenging, so on and so forth. And guys, look also at the movement he's doing. We think of this type of digging as maybe unilateral, but he's using both arms. Okay, so we've got one side, okay, but we've actually got both arms there, and one arm's going to be pulling over too. Okay, so we've got some rotation going on here as well as some, some chopping action. Okay, so... This, I think, is a very good one to almost kind of look at with chainsawing. Here, we want to resist rotation, okay? Here, we're going to be resisting it, but also utilizing it to some extent, okay? Kind of confusing, right? So what do we want to establish first? Well, we'd want to make sure that somebody can resist rotation before we do rotational exercise, okay? Otherwise, that rotational exercise isn't going to be optimized, okay? So this particular job, we're going to do some chops. We're going to do some lifts. Okay, we might have some rows going in there also. Okay, some, some exercises that do mimic the biomechanical demands. Okay, but in mimicking those biomechanical demands, we've also got to look at what additional stresses are these wildland firefighters experiencing. Um, we look at them kind of digging the fire line here, shoveling, okay, but they're also shoveling with backpacks on. Now, um, I came to, a, uh, I've been to the TSAC conferences since they, that they began, and I remember coming to one presentation a few years ago, fantastic presentation in the hands-on section on sprints, okay, how to improve your sprint technique, and it was targeted specifically towards law enforcement officers, okay, how can we improve that sprint to, to be faster chasing the, the, the suspect, and so on and so forth, and I was standing next to a friend of mine, who, a very good friend of mine, who is actually a law enforcement officer, and they were very impressed with what was being taught, but it was being taught by a strength and conditioning coach who had not, excuse me, worked very long with law enforcement. And he's saying, that's great to teach it like this, but we wear belts, okay? We've got belts on here that have a gun possibly here, got a radio here. So it's kind of like what I've got here, I guess. We're, we're running more like this. Just like you can teach perfect kind of landing with the foot. Yeah, we're going to land midfoot and propel up through the toe. Great, but you're wearing Dr. Martin shoes or you're wearing boots. Okay, those things don't bend, okay? The same thing goes here with firefighting tasks, and I think this can be applied a lot to structural folks too. Okay, what else do they have going on that might alter or interfere with optimal mechanics? If they've got a backpack on and they're doing this task, they're going to be having to resist that backpack pulling them down to the ground. Okay, so what do we have to make sure we target? We can't just have them doing isolated movement. And the reason I say this is when we think about doing chops and we think about doing lifts, we oftentimes want to start here, okay? This is kind of how we're taught, right? To start here, start on the knee, isolate that area. That's fine, that's good, but then watch for that movement once they've executed that isolated movement, come into the standing position where they have to kind of compensate for other stresses placed upon the body, okay? So I kind of put that movement pattern limitations in there um, to kind of get you thinking, what else are they wearing? What else are they having to do while they do these, these particular movements? And I'll, I'll come back to this in, in just a moment, too, after we've gone through these others. So lifting and carrying light loads. Just as we would with structural, we're going to think about how these loads are actually applied to the body. If we've got the repositioning of the hoses right down the bottom there, these guys are carrying them over their, their shoulder. Okay, so if we're going to be working on improving this particular skill, then we, too, want to have whatever we are pulling, whatever we're carrying, in a similar, possibly in a similar position, too. 
Um, thinking about how we're lifting up loads. If we think back to some of the, um, which lazy, sorry. If we think back, uh, for example, to some of the pictures that we've seen already, these firefighters are carrying things one-handed. Okay, they might be lifting up a canister, a water jug, for example, a Pulaski tool, some type of equipment. So when we think about the exercises that we choose for these guys, we've got to think about how they're actually lifting this equipment in the real world. Are we going to do some kind of nice bilateral uh, kind of deadlifts here or squats? Or are we going to do more of a suitcase deadlift, perhaps, where we just have one side being lifted? Is that going to be um, a nice even uh, uh, um, dumbbell? Or are we actually going to have them lift up a barbell or a sandbag or, or something else that's a little bit more dynamic to replicate that dynamic nature of what they're actually picking up? And the great thing is that's where we can really start looking at what we have around the, uh, around the base. We can use some of the equipment that we already have. Okay, another little task here that is going to be important for us to uh, um, reflect back on, and this pertains more specifically to our smoke jumpers and our repellers, and that is um, loading equipment, but more specifically parachute jumping and landing. Okay, now we think about, anyone here ever been parachuting, hand gliding? Ooh, cool, fun times. Okay, this is pretty hard, right? This is a lot harder than it looks. Okay, you've got to have some, some strength kind of uh, when you do this. You do have the assistance a little bit, but imagine doing that all day. Okay, imagine doing that every day for the whole entire fire season. That, that's going to take some effort. So we're going to think about upper body strength here, upper body strength and maneuvering, excuse me, maneuvering load above the, above the head. So lap pull down, overhead press, a lot of things overhead here. We could even look at doing farmer's walks where we're actually carrying a load, perhaps, uh, perhaps raised up just a little bit. We'd have to be careful as to what that is, okay? And it has to be, you know, it's not going to be a heavy, heavy load, but looking at maintaining that, that balance might be a training approach that we, uh, we choose to use. Um, landing mechanics are huge. And we just, uh, those of you who sat in on Dr. Um, Frost's talk before mine here today, you saw uh, RG3's landing. I must admit, I've never seen him do the vertical jump like that. Those who didn't see it, RG3's kind of got massive valgus whenever he does a, 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 val, a, um, a valgus jump, a vertical jump, okay? And it's not surprising, those of you who follow him, and I do in particular because that year he was my fantasy football quarterback, so I was very, very annoyed, okay? <laughs> but those of you who do follow him, you know he's had some ACL issues, to say the least. Okay, so with these guys, we want to work on landing mechanics, proper lower extremity movement patterns. Okay, so are we going to have them jump off uh, boxes or onto boxes? Maybe, maybe not, but we're going to work especially, especially hard for these guys as well as for our other guys on making sure their mechanics of lower body movement are appropriate. Because after all, when they're kind of landing, absorbing force, if they don't land properly, that kinetic chain will be all kinds of thrown off. So we've looked a little bit at bioenergetics, we've looked a little bit at biomechanics um, to kind of round out uh, some of this needs analysis, how it pertains to wildland folks. We also need to have a look at what their injury risk is. And there has been very recently, 2013, you guys see Britain up there, 2013, um, she's actually put out several studies looking at trends in wildland firefighter injuries. Great, great studies. And I've got the references on the last couple of pages for you guys. So she's found out information that we might not say is, is too surprising. Um, the injuries that we see in wildland folks are mostly strains and sprains. Um, but they are slightly different in location depending upon what discipline of wildland folks we're working with. So our engine crews and our smoke jumpers who work a little bit more kind of overhead or lifting stuff up, they tend to have more upper body injuries. Our hotshot crews, we've seen lower extremity and I should actually have on there too, low extremity and low back. Okay, that's where we've seen more of the sites of those strains, um, sprains and pulls. But we've also got um, illness related um, risk too. So as we're structural firefighters, we do have the risk of, of thermal stress, okay? And that can potentially then go over into um, uh, heat-related stress, things like, for example, rhabdomyolysis. That's what we've had some big time concern with in wildland uh, guys lately. Those of you know rhabdomyolysis, we're seeing kind of considerable muscle breakdown, danger to uh, liver function there, not a good thing, yeah. Even they've gone as far as to um, talking with the CDC about having, you know the little lactate analyzers? Do you guys see that you have a finger prick? Taking um, analyzers out in the field for these guys and um, evaluating how they're doing for uh, creating kinase out there, okay? 
Um, that's a whole other topic I'll talk about in a second. Cardiovascular events, we do see risk of, of heart attacks in wildland, just like we do structural. Their overall fitness is thought to be actually a little bit higher than structural, but we do still see uh, some of that risk. What they has, what researchers have actually proposed is that that needs to be further broken down into people who are career wildland firefighters versus structural firefighters that have their red cards. And those of you obviously know, know that term. If they've got their red cards, they're, they're doing that too. So that's, that's an interesting uh, trend there. Um, infectious disease. Oh, now, this one is something that's often understated, but it's got a lot more attention in wildland folks recently. If you guys think about training, when you go through training with a sports team, they're training hard, they're doing that, that, all that exercise, they're breaking down everything in their body. That's why we need rest periods, so that we can have the rebuilding effect going on. We know immediately after we do a high intensity exercise bout, our immune function is a just a little bit compromised depending upon how we've accumulated that stress over a given period of time. Well, with wildland guys, they may not get very much rest in between call outs. Okay, so their immune system, depending upon their possibly their fitness level, the stress they've undertaken, there is, there is a, a greater relative risk of it being possibly compromised. So the risk of infectious disease okay, is something that these guys are concerned about. The key take home message is if we can improve fitness, we can potentially reduce the risk of all of these issues, um, especially when we look at some of the mechanisms of injury. Now, I know I don't have too much time to kind of talk about these thoroughly, but the biggest things that have been uh, looked at for mechanisms of injury or illness in guys are these things. Um, do we see optimal movement patterns? And that's why I absolutely love going after people like Dr. Frost because of what he was talking about today. Okay, setting down those movement patterns, how important that absolutely is for um, having optimal, excuse me, neuro neuromuscular function. Um, muscle imbalances, we know this is one of the biggest risks for uh, injury. Um, fitness levels, overexertion and stress. This is big, okay? If you are tired, if you are overexerted, increased risk of slips, trips, and falls. Okay, slips, trips, and falls, sprains, okay, strains, all of that stuff. Um, and then uneven and slippery terrain, which kind of brings me to really some of the last points here in that when we look at this needs analysis for wildland firefighters, we can look at bio bioenergetic, we can look at biomechanical, we can look at injuries, um, but we also need to think about all the other variables that may affect um, their ability to stay fit and variables that might influence the type of fitness programs that we recommend. So these are some of the other stressors that are, are a little bit more unique, some of them, not all of them, but might be a little bit more unique to wildland folks. Um, altitude, okay, these guys are working at higher altitude. Uh, Sharkey and Gaskell came up with um, a great recommendation for acclimatizing folks to that high altitude there. So if any of you guys have um, uh, go skiing, go snowboarding, you know the first few days that you're actually higher up in the mountains, takes a little bit of time to get used to that altitude. Um, I used to live in Salt Lake City. Okay, absolutely loved it. Salt Lake City is about 4,000 feet above sea level. Park City right next door is about uh, 7,500, 8,000, something like that. Okay, so um, first time I went there, I'm a big tennis player. Okay, went there, five minutes playing tennis. <gasps> Good. Okay, kind of like this. Took me about a month to kind of get acclimatized, then I could kind of start playing. So with these guys, this is a recommended kind of climatization um, strategy. It will impact exercise capacity. Okay, sleeping conditions. This uh, diagram, or oh excuse me, poster, I should say, right here. Th this is this is the conditions they're in. Okay, they're not going to waste load by carrying out a tent, by f taking out a big blow-up mattress for them to sleep on at night. Okay, that's added weight. They're not going to do that. So this is what they have to do, okay? So kind of have a little look at this. I, I'm, I'm, my neck is aching looking at a couple of those folks there, okay? So that's sleeping rough, th those, those conditions there. Length of call out, hydration, um, all of these variables. And we know they're gonna vary depending upon what part of the country you're in and maybe even what country you're in, okay? Whether it be Australia, whether it be Greece, whether it be Italy, wherever wildland is needed. So the implications, this is kind of a real brief summary, this in the next slide here, um, bringing together a lot of what we've talked about. Fitness needs to be developed before the season starts, okay, before the season starts. The pack, uh, pack test can help with that, but greater emphasis sometimes needs to be put on things not reflected in the pack test. Um, we've seen about the importance of having a flexible training program. Um, I'm a big proponent whenever I talk to my students about saying for every exercise you have for your client, you need to have at least one regression and one progression. And I was very happy to hear uh, John Hoffman talk a little bit about that yesterday too. So 
flexible training program, you've got to be able to assign it to different individuals and adapt it, if need be, to uh, the different stresses that these guys have actually experienced. And it is a unique set of stresses. Um, acclimatization, developing aerobic fitness, these are obviously our, our big points. Um, I will kind of finish up here with just talking about the last one real quick. We looked at some specific biomechanical movement patterns and some suggested exercises that might reflect those. That does not mean you have to cater your exercise program or prescription exactly to those exercises. Okay, those could be supplemental exercises. Those could be things to help improve overall muscular strength that you might be establishing in your, in your firefighters. They could be used to help buy, uh, get buy-in with the firefighters. So this resistance training program is reflective, for example, of the movement patterns you will see out in the field. So that kind of train for the job, task-specific movement patterns and fitness attributes, that is a very, very important po uh, component, but it doesn't mean you only have to have exercises that are movement specific. All right, last couple of things here. These are all uh, pretty straightforward things, building in balance and stability. Um, and then our last one here, I know we talked about it already, but training on duty. Uh, this is something that is very situation specific for wildland folks. Okay, the uh, studies done by Katie Dennison, 2012, that was on structural folks. Okay, so whether you should train on duty with wildland, um, this, is, this is an even more intense debate than it is for structural guys um, because they don't have the recovery periods, the, uh, the off shift that structural guys do. So um, recommendation right now is it depends, okay, as the answer is to a lot of things, okay. Um, so that's my very quick summary of wildland firefighters, okay. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with uh, a lot of what I talked about here. So hopefully for some of you it's kind of review, but the big take home message I want you guys to get is that we do need a need is needs analysis. The needs analysis may differ depending upon what discipline of wildland folks you're working with and what type of program, what type of year you're actually implementing that program, okay? But the good thing is they are very open to improving fitness, okay? Maintaining good fitness. Uh, I've had a lot of success working with them, a lot of in enjoyment, and they've been very, very receptive to a lot of uh, what has been recommended. Okay. Good. Any questions? Go for it. Oh, it's not lactate testing. It's uh, sorry. It's um, a similar machine, li like a lactate analyzer. Um, no, if but, but for uh, creating kinase instead. So the enzyme marker. No, sorry about that. The good thing is they were trying to develop something that's very, very portable that literally could be taken out that didn't require um, a whole lot of training to use because obviously a lot of firefighters are also EMT, so and they have that additional training. So it's not as if you're giving them a toy to kind of play with. So um, that's that's what they're experimenting with right now. Um, it got, there was a big, big last, last year, some of those who are in wildland, please feel free to share what, what you've experienced with this too, but there was um, a few cases, I think it was about 10 cases total that the CDC identified looking at trends that they felt were possibly rhabdomyolysis related. Um, not, they weren't always hospitalized for it, but um, it did impact work capacity. So it could have been, it might have been just heat related stress, not diagnosed rhabdo, but as a preventative strategy, they were going to try and introduce that. Did you? Okay. And that's actually a really, really good point because what came out too was some, uh, some, some flyers and some uh, documents saying, um, remember what else is related to or can increase your risk of rhabdo. So crea um, um, uh, uh, creatine use, for example, supplementation, lack of hydration. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of other things on there supplement wise and things like that. So they came out with those recommendations too. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. Oh my goodness. So the, the so mm -hmm. you yeah it is a growing so something that's being identified because of a little bit more testing that's going on and more recognition of what it actually is so they see kind of the warning signs of it go get tested go go check your you're okay kind of thing so we're seeing these potential cases or, or um, uh, precursor cases kind of emerging a lot more frequently now, which I don't think is a bad thing, to be honest with you. I don't think it's a, to be able to recognize those signs and symptoms of it before it gets too bad, that's not always a bad thing. Okay, good. Okay, if you guys have any other questions, um, I know we're kind of at the end of time, but please feel free to come up. I'm hanging around here, last uh, presentation of the day. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a good one.